Welcome to Policy on Demand. I'm Roz Brooks. To say we are living in an increasingly complex world of geopolitics would not be surprising to anyone. No matter your interests, understanding the implications for the US, other countries, and the global policy agenda is a lot to process and digest. So where do we begin? Well, today we begin with a conversation with Dr. Alexis Crow. Alexis is the chief economist for PwC. Alexis, welcome, it's great to see you. Thanks so much for having me, Roz. All right, so let's get to it. I know you're here in Washington for the meetings with the IMF and the World Bank. There are two groups that cover a range of issues related to monetary policy. So I want to know, what have you been hearing and what have you taken away? Oh, sure. Thanks so much. So it's, it's a wonderful time to level set for global economists, policymakers, finance ministers, and central bankers. I call it nerd bowl for economists. <laughs> um, and where we are just in terms of the global economic outlook, it's really lackluster growth. Mm. You know, we, we're, we're stable. Uh, IMF forecast 3.2%. Um, at that range, that's that's really not necessarily impressive in contrast with the pre-pandemic trend. Um, and when we look beneath that, in advanced economies, the United States has received significant upgrades. It's really the kind of single engine driving economic growth for the advanced economy group. Europe looking fairly lackluster, Japan looking fairly lackluster within Europe. Uh, Germany and France uh, really contracting and bearing the brunt of the energy crisis, particularly in Germany. Um, some Southern European countries looking slightly brighter, uh, Portugal and Spain. The true bright spots looking outside of the advanced economies would be India, parts of emerging Asia, including Vietnam, forecasted to grow at 6.1%. India forecasted to hover around 65 to 7%. Um, and pockets of, interestingly enough, Middle Eastern countries. Even though we have conflict in the Middle East, UAE is forecast to grow at 5.1% next year, um, so posting quite strong growth. Um, where we also look is just on the, as you mentioned, central banking policy. We're also looking on the return to price stability. We are in a disinflationary environment, um, which is reflective of not only supply shocks waning, but also an unprecedented amount of monetary tightening that we've seen across the globe. Mm -hmm. Other kind of things that we're hearing, you always hear about climate finance mm -hmm. and the need to mobilize private capital. Um, that hasn't gone away. The urgency and the discussion of it hasn't gone away, but the solutions are, are not necessarily with us. And um, there's also a lot of chat about Gen AI and its impact on the economy um, and on labor force. Okay, so it's interesting you mentioned about how the U.S. seemed to be a growth engine within when you look at kind of what seems to be lackluster growth, but when you dig into it, the U.S. is fueling like some, some of that from the standpoint, because there seems to be at least a perception in the U.S. Um, I know our recent Pulse survey of CEOs talked about, I think it was northward of 70% were thinking that a recession is coming. And so there's this notion about that the U.S. is headed toward or, or soon to be kind of in a recession. It's a lot of speculation. So it's fascinating to me, and I have a lot of questions to kind of, if things seem to be going so well, where is this coming from? But let's start with this. How does, let's say hypothetically, a recession, we, we recently have gone through recessionary kind of things. How does a recession in a major economy like the US or China or the EU for that matter, um, affect the global economy? And as a follow-up, because I'll give you a twofer, um, what are central banks and governments doing to avoid a recession and keep the economy stable? Firstly, everybody's forecasting whether or not the Fed will achieve this soft landing uh, amidst this unprecedented monetary policy tightening, um, whether or not we will uh, evade a, a recession. Mm -hmm. What's important to note is I think a lot of investors and executives can, and, and headlines can kind of conflate recession, contraction, depression, mm. correction in the markets. And certainly where, where we are, a technical recession is just two consecutive quarters of, of a contraction in growth. We had a technical recession in the United States in 2022, but nobody made a song in advance about it. Even I mean, Europe just narrowly escaped a technical recession last year, bearing that brunt of the energy crisis as well. So we're, we're still in this time of sort of tepid economic growth across the globe. And then the United States, again, quite a lot stronger, posting 3%. GDP in this last quarter that we have in terms of data. Um, so where we where we look on that landscape is what, how durable and how healthy are labor markets at the moment. And what's interesting to note, labor force participation rate for prime age workers in the United States is at a 14 year high. Mm. 
So even though we had some jobs data kind of scare some market participants going back to the summer, um, what that has been reflective of is just rising immigration numbers. So more people are just looking for jobs because you have more entrance to the labor market in terms of foreign born workers. Um, we also just look at other indicators such as consumer spending, which remains quite robust in the United States. Again, even despite a depletion of those pandemic savings buffers that households have had, we've seen spending quite resilient. Latest retail sales, people are spending on healthcare, personal services, et cetera. And then companies are also continuing to invest. Um, so gross fixed capital formation, a fancy way of saying private fixed investment, has actually been rising in value terms, in part reflective of a higher cost of input environment. Um, but in the United States, companies are actually still investing. Um, so we seem to have emerged from that you know, relatively um, unscathed. So we seem to be in quite a soft landing environment. But to answer your question about how a potential recession might impact the global economy, so what interesting to note, we've seen significant slowing of growth in mainland China. Yeah. And it's interesting just to note what that does to commodity markets. Mm -hmm. So if you see significant contraction, for example, in Chinese demand, you start to see oil slip in mm. some ways because market participants are forecasting that. Um, looking across to Europe, it's interesting to note, again, Germany is the largest economy within the Eurozone and has been contracting significantly, mm. manufacturing activity slipping, but that hasn't necessarily pulled you know, the world into a, a global recession. I think where I would come to is where do you see a potential financial crisis amplifying any kind of an economic downturn? So that's when you would say how deep would a recession actually be? And that's where we have to look at where there are pockets of financial instability lurking. And guess what? In the United States, we love financialization of our economy. So you know, there's certainly some imbalances mm -hmm. building up. Where would you say those imbalances are? So it's interesting. I, we just did a panel on private credit here yesterday in the IMF meetings. And, and this is one thing that we have our eyes acutely focused on. So we look at global assets under management those under management of the traditional banks have been basically regulated out since the global financial crisis. And we've seen assets under management grow significantly and be eclipsed by those in the non-bank financial institutions. There are pockets of instability there where we have a lot of opacity into balance sheets, valuations, the growth of things like business development companies, uh, instruments like payment in kind, mm. um, and also just looking at open-ended funds could cause some kind of a run on the bank scenario. And that's certainly what we have our eyes focused on, particularly in the United States. So we've got a lot of things, a lot of developments that impact um, the economy. We're talking about elections, wars, technology, just to name a few. And it, it affects everything, right? We talk about, people talk about the price of groceries when they go to the store. You talk about market participants when you think about the, the stock market and, and others. And we mentioned job numbers, kind of what employment looks like. So I want to ask you how these developments or significant economic drivers are affecting investment. So I think it's important to distinguish between corporate investment and then household investment okay. and, and retail investing. So on the corporate side, as I mentioned, what's so interesting is that that fancy term gross fixed capital formation in the United States has been rising. Uh, so that is you know, not a significant driver of our GDP growth. 70% of our GDP growth comes from consumption on the personal side. Um, but business investment has been growing steadily. And so again, what we've, what we've seen notably is amidst that rate rise environment that we've been in, in the United States, an unprecedented amount of global tightening in monetary policy, companies are still willing to invest. One of those investments could be sustainability, another could be gen AI um, or gen AI adjacency, such as data centers, um, upskilling uh, and, and workforce investments, et cetera. Um, so that has remained quite durable in the United States. It's remained quite durable in Japan. Um, in pockets of the Eurozone, we've seen investment slipping. We've seen production moving offshore out of Germany, just given its adjacency to the energy and exposure and vulnerability to the energy crisis. France has remained relatively unscathed given its power by nuclear power. The UK, unfortunately, is in its own situation due to the macro shocks of the Brexit uh, referendum still um, impacting the British economy. 
So on the personal side, what's interesting to note is when everybody's been talking about what would happen in a potential recession, is China going to contract and or, or significantly recede in terms of growth? Everyone's picking on to retail sales as like this little bright spot. And, yeah. and as I mentioned, in the US, we've been relatively resilient. Even in the UK, has been relatively resilient. Even in China, we've seen retail sales being markedly robust. Mm-hmm. So the consumers held up relatively well. Part of the reason for that, Roz, too, is that even though we've had pandemic savings depleted in the United States, according to Fed data, the disposable income, so debt service costs as a percentage of your disposable income in the United States is actually not dramatically high on a historical basis. So said another way, debt service costs, even though those have been elevated, we've seen rising credit card delinquencies on a historical basis, it's not necessarily leading to that much of an overstretch. Also, just thinking in terms of investment, we have to look where governments are going to be able to invest in um, and to be generating long-term sustainable investments. And we've seen that in the United States with the IRA. We've seen the way that that's catalyzed a lot of private capital and mobilized a lot of private capital in the clean tech space and up and across the energy spectrum. Um, a country like India will need to be focused on garnering investment into the infrastructure space and to be able to significantly drive manufacturing growth if it's to become really the single engine for the emerging market economies. And so that's, I think, certainly something that we're going to be focused on in this tepid market, who can attract and accrue the most foreign direct investment. So this is why I always love talking to you. I always like learn things. And then there are always things that resonate like in my world as I think about purely kind of policy. Um, There's obviously the economy and everything is changing. I don't get into it as deep as you do. But a few things you said resonated with me. Like you were saying that investment from a corporate standpoint has been going up, just kind of um, from a US perspective has been has been occurring. And then you also said when you look at the historical data in terms of the debt servicing, kind of the rescue for for consumers. I always feel like from a US perspective, when you think about the elections and everyone, it's the economy stupid, right? Like, would you think about like, people don't feel like that historical data, they don't feel that like, okay, 10 years ago, it may have been one thing, but right now I'm feeling like I can't yeah. go and do something. Our recent corporate survey of, of CEOs, our Pulse survey actually indicated the notion that companies are going to continue to invest no matter who is in the White House. But I'm curious your perspective, because elections have consequences. So what impact do you think the election might have, the U.S. election might have on investment? Well, I do want to tease something else that you mentioned there is, on the consumer side, it's important to strip out sentiment from actual spending. Yeah. And so we've been in, the, the U.S. consumer has been in a recessionary mindset, even though consumer spending has held up remarkably well. And so there's a huge spread between vibes, as one Fed official will call it, (laughs) and actual spending. And that continues, okay, we just had some positive consumer data coming out today. I I always tell the team, like, let's just look at the actual numbers and what people are pulling out of their pockets. Nevertheless, Americans do feel economically insecure, in part because we've suffered multiple inflation shocks. Mm. You have a generation that's never experienced, that's been living in disinflation. Mm. You have a generation that's never experienced a price shock. And so even though inflation is coming down, Mm. some prices may still be rising. And the general American population doesn't understand the sources of those inflation shocks. And so, and, and how little central banks can do to actually increase the supply of food or oil. And so that's important to, to call out. And I think that is contributing to a lot of the uncertainty that we're feeling in, the, in this electoral environment in the United States. And when I speak with foreign investment banks, a lot are, are braced for the outcome. But I don't think that, I think regardless of who, who wins and takes the White House, we have this acronym called TINA, like there is no alternative. Mm. And so we continue to see, even there's a lot of concern about political gridlock, which is your world, political gridlock, the rising fiscal deficit, record levels of debt in the G7 economies, people still look at the United States um, as as a a desirable place to park capital, whether it's in terms of equities, um, where we've again seen US equity markets outperforming their European peers recently and continuing to do so, whether it's in terms of foreign direct investment, and I would even say it's interesting, some executives in the green and clean tech space are concerned that if you had potentially a Trump administration, you wouldn't necessarily have 
uh, you know, the same opportunities. But actually, I would say that given how many of the red states have benefited from the IRA, I don't think that some of their fears are, are necessarily warranted. Yeah, yeah, that's that's kind of the general thought that we have. I have a new acronym now that I'm going to take into my personal life. I love Tina. There is no alternative. <laughs> um, so let's turn to sanctions for just a minute. Obviously, the current administration has been active when we think about sanctions that have occurred. There's a lot of angst about sanctions, tariffs, things that may come if in a different administration, particularly in an administration where former President Trump comes back. Could you just talk a little bit about in, even in the current environment, how the sanctions have played out, how the dynamics have played out, and how they affect companies and investors. I'm going to take that in three stages. One is, you know, just the overarching use of we're using guns, not butter, hmm. in terms of our alliances. And it's interesting, like a lot of our alliances and posturing around the world in the United States has been with a focus on defense rather than economic incentives. And even on the economic lens, it's more punitive than it is incentivizing. Um, so we've seen, you know, the WTO charts this out, record levels of, of protectionist movements coming out of governments, including the United States. And when the United States dismantles the Washington consensus that it spread across the globe, or the Marshall Plan, um, what's very clear is that other countries think that they can just follow suit. Um, and so, again, I'm just with some members of the WTO last week, and they're very, very concerned about this, the global trade architecture. And, and, and Roz, it's important to note, I think that that protectionism in the United States is bipartisan, as mm -hmm. you well know. This mm -hmm. is not a Republican thing. And we've seen uh, Douglas Irwin is, is one person who's charted this out, where we've seen rising protectionism in the Democratic Party. Um, and so that's very clear. Um, one thing that I will note is when meeting with global investors and central bankers is the extent to which there is a concerted agreement that the United States has misused sanctions mm. and that that has undermined the international role of the US dollar. Um, and now, when we look and we've done a deep dive into this and we continue to monitor this, when we look at the actual data, some of this is sort of Sturm und Drang when you talk about the rise of the BRICS currency, et cetera, because even though central, some central banks have increased their holdings of gold, we've not seen a large kind of reduction of US treasuries in terms of foreign holdings um, or the US dollar. Again, because Tina, there is no alternative. Mm -hmm. But there's a large growing community that would say that the US has misused sanctions and that's undermining its position on the world stage. As to what companies and investors do about it, I mean, that's one interesting thing is we don't really see any challenge to the US dollar. So what treasuries are doing in terms of their holdings, I think, is significant. There are longer term structural implications of the uh, shrugging off of the fiscal deficit yeah. and the rising fiscal deficit. And I think that has longer term implications for the US. What I would advise executives on this front is be braced for more guns, not butter. All right, guns not butter. That is as soon as you said it I, in my mind, I was like, I know exactly. Like it's that's an that's I love analogies, and I, and you were really bringing this to life to me for me. So thank you so much. So I'm going to turn specifically to the regulatory landscape, right? So there's a lot of movement both in the U.S. and the EU on several areas. You mentioned sustainability, AI. You've got companies heavily investing in sustainability, Gen AI, cybersecurity. How are companies with global footprints navigating the various approaches and looking to stay competitive? I'll take that in two turns. I mean, I think the first one on sustainability, and if we want to really kind of focus on sustainability is in the eye of the beholder, right? But if we want to really focus on the environmental component of that, I would say it's a tale of two cities. Mm. The United States is increasingly in one place and Europe is very much in a different place. Um, and, and I remember being in Palm Beach where you and I have been together in 2023 in January and speaking with some board directors who have openly questioned as to whether or not delivering on net zero commitments is in contrast with the fiduciary duty. And then going across to Davos, which is kind of the spiritual home mm -hmm. of, of climate and the environment, and, and, and that's not negotiable. Yeah. Um, and we're, we're really seeing that. I'm seeing that with clients uh, in the investor space where they said, OK, we developed this kind of sustainability linked fund. We're going to list it in Luxembourg. We're not going to list it in the United States. Yeah. Um, so, so that continues, that path continues to diverge. It's interesting, too, because it's a reflection of the policy landscape where even though we've had a green administration in the United States, 
During that time, we have produced record amount of oil in the United States. We've become a net oil exporter, and we've, we're now the number one LNG exporter in the world. So I think that's reflective of that environment. On the Gen AI landscape, you know, the best practices that I'm seeing are companies that are super engaged at, at all levels of the regulatory environment um, and in all jurisdictions where they're operating because the regulation is moving so quickly. Um, so to have a seat at the table, and I think to have a responsible stewardship approach to we all need to govern this to be able to make it work for humans and to work for, for positive social change. So um, just thinking about some companies that have come together um, in a truly global way, I think that's been very, very positive. So Alexis, I honestly could talk to you about this all day. I find it very fascinating. You make it very real for me. I like how you broke down some of the terms and everything, um, but I can't keep you forever. I also can't let you go without asking you about the election. So as we think about the upcoming U.S. election, I have never been so involved in kind of understanding foreign policy or understanding geopolitics as I was kind of starting in 2016, kind of moving forward. So my question for you is, how do you see the U.S. election impacting the geopolitical landscape? And I mean, Will we continue to live in a tense kind of environment? Can we expect some easing no matter who comes in? Like, give me some calm, Alexis, please. Don't know if I can offer that. <laughs> I would say geopolitics really starts popping up in advanced economies in 2016. Yeah, uh -huh. Here I would say, let's call out three key things. I mean, one is, again, important to note that shared policy lens of protectionism that's yeah. bipartisan, yeah. right? I mean, so that's important to note because again, it sort of regardless of who takes the White House on that front. Then you say there's a change in tone, but not in stance necessarily mm -hmm. in terms of policy. Um, I would say the defining geopolitical trend of our era is the strategic rivalry between the United States and China. That is fundamentally rooted in America's national insecurity complex when it comes to China's rise. And how we deal with that is going to be very, very interesting. And I think how that's dealt with in terms of foreign policy, again, what we've seen is the United States pursuing this guns, not butter approach with the Indo-Pacific, pushing other European allies to be able to push that sort of Indo-Pacific strategy as well. You're with us or against us, very Manichaean worldview. Um, I don't see that disappearing, unfortunately. So protectionism, China. This third piece on Europe is really important because that is one dramatic shift that we saw with the Biden administration, healing of transatlantic ties, uh, mm -hmm. a pause on certain tariffs and, and trade disputes. And that is that is a question. I think that is a one huge policy change and shift that we could see depending on the outcome of the election. And so Europeans are, are braced for that. Um, as a facet of that, I would say that you know underpinning all of this is even though the US is pursuing this guns not butter stance in the Indo-Pacific, it has largely withdrawn from its role as the global policeman, as the global hegemon. We continue to see this withdrawal. It's almost inefficacy in resolving some of the major armed conflicts that we've seen across the globe, even going back to 2001 all the way to the present moment. Mm. And I don't see that unfortunately disappearing. So we need some more imaginative policy as to how to re-engage and be a leader on the world stage. Alexis, this has been great. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me, Roz. 